Hello and welcome to lecture three. This lecture is going to discuss the Bitcoin economy. In this lecture, we will discuss the following. First, we're going to talk about the metrics of a currency. Whether you're trading in the yen, the yuan, the dollar, the pound, every single currency used on the planet that's considered to be legitimate has certain metrics that we can look at it from. For example, the distribution of the money. Is the money widely spread? and there's equal distribution amongst everyone, or is it hoarded by a small group of people? Uh, the supply and demand of the money, how much supply is there? Is there $200 million in circulation or $2 trillion in circulation? How much demand is there for it? How many people wish to acquire dollars because of trade? Uh, exchanges for the money. If you purchase, let's say, an Xbox from England, well, England prices things in the pound, and the United States prices things in the US dollar. And let's say you purchase this Xbox off of, off of eBay and you're using PayPal to make your payment. Well, if this is the case, uh, you even though you've purchased an object in pounds, it's been priced for you automatically by the software in US dollars. And when you pay in US dollars, there are a series of millmans, international agreements, regulations, and such and such that actually handle all of those details of converting your US dollars into pounds so that the person in England will actually go ahead and receive pounds directly as if it was his next door neighbor handing him money. Uh, and you will receive your Xbox without any hardship or issue as long as, of course, he ships it. So exchanges for money are very important. We're going to discuss them. Relationship to other currencies is another important feature. Certain currencies tend to be deeply interrelated with each other. For example, the US dollar and the euro are incredibly closely connected, as are the US dollar and the uh, yuan and the US dollar and the yen. This is because of a variety of political and other factors. And oligarchalness is a term that I've used a lot to discuss, and it comes from the term oligarchy, which means rule from a few. Uh, oligarchy is generally when you have a small group of people who have a considerable influence over society. Uh, and there are many who would argue, for example, even in the United States, that there are a small group of power brokers, about 100 or 200,000 uh, personal, private, uh, and corporate entities, because of the amount of money they put into politics, are able to influence decisions. So this is kind of an indirect oligarchy, whereas you could have uh, other cases like a dictatorship, where the oligarchy is very apparent. It's the henchman of the dictator and the dictator. So the term oligarchiness I tend to use to describe wow, to what level do small groups have an influence or control over a currency? So in terms of a high oligarchical currency, high oligarchicalness currency, uh, that would be the case where a small group of people can have a dramatic impact upon the money. In the United States, would be classified as that because we have this thing called the Federal Reserve System, which can affect the supply of the money and also uh, shoot for certain price points of the money. They can have dramatic impacts on the credibility, faith, and supply of the U.S. dollar. So a small group of people you've never seen, met, or dealt with can have a huge amount of impact on the money in your pocket. Whereas, for example, a currency backed in gold uh, with no central bank would be a low oligarchicalness currency because regardless of people's attempts, no one entity is probably going to be able to significantly influence the supply of the money, nor the demand of the money, or its uh, value in terms of other currencies. That will be determined by just simple economics. And then we have Bitcoin-specific metrics. For example, mining pool hash rate, work distribution, uh, regulation, Bitcoin days destroyed, which is a metric we'll discuss in a bit, and the blockchain, which is another really wonderful pool of metrics that I'll go ahead and discuss in a bit. Okay, so let's begin with the distribution of money. There are four questions that we tend to ask when we're talking about the distribution of money. The first question we ask is, where is the money geographically based? And this kind of seems like an obvious question. We'd say, well, if it's the money of the United States, wouldn't it be based in the United States? And actually, it turns out there is more money outside of the United States than there is inside the United States. If you were to go to China, for example, and go to Beijing, you can actually purchase in many of the shops in Beijing items in the U.S. dollar. Even though it's not a legal tender, the Chinese merchants can accept the uh, U.S. dollar as uh, payment. 
So the geographical basis of the money kind of gives you an idea of the overall influence that country has globally speaking. As the United States is the largest and most powerful economy in the world right now, uh, it has a tremendous amount of influence and therefore its money is geographically very distributed. Um, the second question we tend to ask is the money evenly distributed or controlled by a few? And this is a very misunderstood question. So I've included a graph here of the United States wealth distribution. If you take a look at the bottom 80%, they control 12.8% of the entire wealth of the United States, whereas the top 20% control 87.2%. So the top 1% control 35%, and this has been increasing over time. If the top 20% banded together and made a decision to pull all of their money out of the economy, put it into a cool wet sack in their basements, respectively, it would collapse the entire US economy. Nothing would get done. But because we have incredibly efficient financial markets, uh, this money actually ends up being distributed to the bottom 80% in terms of debt, loans through banks, um, venture capital for companies. Uh, equity in companies, there are many ways that the top 20% can take their wealth and reinvest it for a return to the bottom 80% to keep the economy going. So this is really something that's deeply related with the efficiency and quality and regulation of the financial markets that allow the distribution of the money. Uh, so it's a very important metric. How does the money move through the economy? This is another very important uh, question about distribution. Generally speaking, if your money is moving very slowly, this is a signal of a recession and impediments to effective trade, meaning exchange is not happening well for some reason. Uh, and if your money is moving very quickly, very rapidly, this is an indication of a booming economy. And this is generally how economists tend to think of it. So therefore, they actually measure the movement of money through an economy and have developed many metrics to assess that, which are beyond the scope of this class. Um, how is new money added to the system? So in the case of the United States, it's done through a complex series of transactions involving the Federal Reserve System, Treasury bills, banks, and the US Treasury Department, amongst other factors and um, entities. Uh, and so this is a really important question because if you add new money to your system poorly, then you end up constructing a system that a small group of people can take advantage of and use this to the detriment of society. So it's, um, it's something we tend to think about, all central banks tend to think about and try to do in a way that doesn't harm particularly the bottom 80%. So it's usually done with interest and debt. So Bitcoin distribution. So how is Bitcoin geographically distributed? Well, it's geographically decentralized by design. The Bitcoin holds no flag. There's not an American flag on it. There's not a Japanese flag. It's a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer currency. There is no notion of a nation state or controlling interest. That said, it has significant penetration in developed markets, particularly the United States, Europe, Russia, and Japan. Over 85% of all the Bitcoins currently in circulation are contained within these entities. Over time, the hope is that the Bitcoin will become more and more decentralized. And the hope actually, the hope of the Bitcoin decentralization is that it will become more used in countries with weak, unstable currencies. You may recall from lecture one when we discussed the Zimbabwean financial crisis, had people in the country transferred the Zimbabwean money into Bitcoins, they would have actually wrote out that entire crisis without any issue whatsoever because the Bitcoin is independent from the economy of Zimbabwe. And if they could find a way to conduct commerce in the Bitcoin while that crisis was occurring, they would have no wealth destruction. They'd be completely fine and everything would be okay. Uh, so there's been a lot of movement to try to influence um, weaker nation states or weaker economies, the people of these weaker economies, to go ahead and develop, uh, embrace the Bitcoin as uh, a pseudo-national currency which is kind of a unique and intriguing concept. Okay, so or early adopters actually still control a large chunk of the Bitcoins in circulation. In fact, I've included a link here. This link is from the Bitcoin report, and it's listed in order of the from the smallest to the largest accounts. And because accounts are anonymous, we just have their public addresses, that's where you send the money to, we're not entirely sure uh, who this money belongs to. but. 
All we know is that this particular account here has 447,785 Bitcoins. Uh, and as you can see, the rest are fairly uh, populated as well. Um, this tells us that the early adopters of the Bitcoin still have a considerable amount of control and influence over the uh, Bitcoin money supply. And many have yet to sell because they think that the price of the Bitcoin is still too low. But as the price has gone up, we've seen some of the largest accounts actually uh, divest very quickly. Um, it's difficult to know the particular people who control the, um, the Bitcoins in the economy. And it's also difficult to know if these addresses are aggregated together into a larger whole. For example, the largest one that we know of is 447,000, but someone could control a million Bitcoins, for example, and just simply have them in many, many, many small accounts. And this is a price we pay for the anonymity of addresses. Uh, maybe in the future, regulation will compel people to reveal their Bitcoin holdings. But as of right now, uh, no one is compelled to do so. We don't know who owns the Bitcoins. We just know that there are certain accounts that are highly aggregated, and they have been so for some time. So the assumption is that they're early adopters, people who started working on the Bitcoin back in 2009, 2010, 2011, when they were very cheap and uh, very accessible. Over time, the Bitcoins have become more distributed, particularly after the price hit $100 per Bitcoin. We started seeing more people for the first time entering the market, um, and we saw some of the older accounts, which had not moved their holdings for quite some time, actually liquidating for the first time ever. Uh, and this is very common with any asset. If you look at startups, for example, the CEO and the board of directors and so forth and all the interesting people who started with that company will probably have a significant equity share. But after an initial public offering, over time, the core group of early adopters will start selling off their holdings. And after 10, 25 years, uh, the largest shareholders tend to be mutual funds and other institutions, not the founders of the company, which is to be expected of the Bitcoin. Uh, we typically measure Bitcoin movement with a metric called Bitcoin Days Destroyed. I have a very good way of explaining this, and I'm going to reserve it for a little bit later in the, in the um, lecture. And new Bitcoins are added to the Bitcoin economy by a process called Bitcoin mining. This is so incredibly important that I'm actually going to discuss Bitcoin mining in its own dedicated lecture, lecture four. So hold tight on that one. All right. So the next topic of money, of currencies, to help you understand what a currency is and the metrics upon which to understand its economy and value are supply and demand. The supply uh, and demand of a currency are usually measured by a really complex series of signals divine from international trade and monetary exchanges well beyond the scope of our course. You can get a PhD in economics and still not understand this topic very well. The people who do tend to make a lot of money either by uh, being professional traders in the Forex market or consultants for um, hedge funds or other institutions which financially benefit from the supply and demand, of, from understanding the supply and demand of money at a high level. You'll, you also can have a very rewarding career working for the Federal Reserve System if you understand this. So again, it's well beyond the notions of, of the scope of this course. But what we will say is, generally speaking, for any currency that is fiat-based, uh, there's usually a central authority that will decide how much money to put into circulation. And they do this based upon certain benchmarks. So they'll say, what do we want our interest rates in society to be? What do we want our employment levels in society to be? And they're either going to increase the money supply or contract the money supply to achieve these political factors. You can also manipulate your currency for the purpose of trade. For example, China does this. They do this uh, a great deal with the goal of increasing their exports. So if China's money is very cheap, this means that we in the United States can buy more stuff from China with the same amount of US dollars. So the Chinese central bank actually prints a great deal of money to ensure that the price of Chinese money is artificially low, despite the fact that natural market economics would want to appreciate the value, increase the value. 
and this is done to make sure that their factories are always working so they can have lots of jobs. This was kind of a complex topic, but there's a gentleman named Sal Khan who created a series of completely free courses on Khan Academy, which not only discuss banking, but actually discuss how China manipulates their currency here, foreign exchange and trade. And if you're really curious about how this works, I'd highly recommend um, just creating a free account and watching these lectures. They're about 5, 10, some, some are about 15 minutes long, and each and every one of them explains a certain component of how banking or foreign exchange or how currencies work. Uh, and then after you watch all of them, you'll have a pretty strong understanding of how uh, central banks manipulate currencies for the benefit of the societies that uh, host them. There's also an incredibly deep system of interconnected banks, regulatory agencies, and treaties built around easy conversion of one money to another. So when we used the example of purchasing an Xbox from England, where you take your U.S. dollar and you... You know, exchange it somehow, some way into a pound seamlessly, and and that person selling you the Xbox receives pounds for payment, and then he ships you the Xbox, and then you get it, as if you went down to Walmart and purchased it. Uh, this is only possible because of treaties, regulatory agencies, banks, and a lot of magic working behind the scenes. It's very complex magic, and it's very hard to maintain. It costs tens of billions of dollars, a lot of inefficiency, a lot of mistakes are made, um, and so it's a, it's a complex topic. The Bretton Woods Agreement is really an amazing thing, too. If you look it up, it happened in 19, I believe, 43, as a consequence of World War II. The Allies believed they were going to win the war, and they started having a discussion about how they were going to rebuild the world's money system, and because the United States was the principal victor, and because the other alternative was to embrace the Soviet Union, we, the United States, received a significant uh, upper hand in these negotiations, basically becoming the default reserve currency of the world, which benefited our economy and our interest rates tremendously and helped us grow so quickly after World War II. So I'd highly encourage you, if you're curious about this, to read about the Bretton Woods Agreement and also to take Sal Khan's courses, and you'll get a, a stronger sense of how magical and rich this system has to be to allow one person to purchase some item in a country they've never been to and do have that happen seamlessly and money to move around as quickly as it does. Okay, so how does the Bitcoin supply and demand of money work? Well, what's really interesting about the Bitcoin is it behaves like a, a commodity where we already know how much exists. So imagine if we knew where all the gold in the world is. And we knew how much gold that is, every rock of it. And we understood how much time it would take, and we created a constant rate at which the gold would be extracted. This is kind of the situation with the Bitcoin. Because of algorithmic constraints, which are now enforced by every single node in the entire Bitcoin network, meaning it's practically impossible unless you get the entire internet to agree, to change the supply, there is no way to ever have more than 21 million Bitcoins. Furthermore, we also understand the rate at which Bitcoins are produced. By algorithm, this is constrained to be approximately 10 minutes right now for every 25 Bitcoins, and every four years, that is reduced by half. So uh, we, we just uh, reduced it from 50 to 25. The next reduction will be 12.5. And if you do the math, this will tell you that by the year 2140, we'll have every Bitcoin ever in existence, which is an incredibly unique concept. It's really, it's really an amazing thing. Because the supply is fixed, the currency is intrinsically deflationary. You may have heard things like 98% of the value of the U.S. dollar has been destroyed since 1913, and that's absolutely true. If you held $1 in 1913, today's dollar is only worth 2% of that. Whereas the Bitcoin is intrinsically deflationary, which means that every single year, if it survives as a currency, it has to gain value because there was going to be more demand, whereas the supply is relatively fixed in relation to demand, the value per Bitcoin will go up. Now, the reason why this does not yield a phenomenon called deflationary spiral is that the Bitcoins are completely divisible and they're divisible to basically as many digits as we algorithmically wish to enforce. Right now, it's eight digits. So you can have 
practically unlimited fractions of a Bitcoin in circulation and um, price them very nicely comporting to other currencies. There has never been a digital deflationary currency. So unfortunately for us, we're kind of, and actually fortunately too, it's kind of a double-edged sword, we're in a completely new no man's land of economic theory. No one's tried this before. We've had currencies that are based upon a commodity. Like for example, the US dollar up until the 70s used to be based upon gold, which theoretically meant that you could go to a Federal Reserve Bank and take one of your dollar notes, hand it to them, and they would hand you that value in gold. And up until the 1970s, you, uh, you could get for $30 a troy ounce of gold. I think the price is now around, what, $1,400, $1,500. It changes every now and then. But in the 1970s, the, you could actually just go and exchange U.S. dollar for gold. Fortunately, it was fractional reserve, which meant we had many, 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 many times more uh, dollars in circulation than the U.S. government had gold on hand. So if everybody tried to change their dollars in for gold, they would, it would be equivalent to a bank run. They would break the bank. So we decided to just remove the gold standard completely and go to a total fiat currency, meaning there's nothing backing it. Whereas the Bitcoin is kind of like that in terms that it's a deflationary currency as if it was based on a gold standard, yet it is backed only by algorithmic constraints and it's infinitely divisible. So while it's deflationary, the deflationary nature does not seem to interfere with commerce. Uh, so we've never had this before. We've never tried to mash a commodity-based currency with a digital currency and completely decentralize it. It's an experiment, and it's really an amazing experiment if you, uh, if you like economics. Interestingly enough, as more people use the Bitcoin, which is very likely going to happen because of low transaction fees and anonymity, demand will dramatically outpace supply, which means if you are an early adopter of the Bitcoin, and people were buying them a few years back for 10 cents a piece, uh, you probably are a millionaire today. And that's just how it works when you're an early adopter of anything that takes off. Imagine if you were one of the first employees at Google or at Microsoft or at Apple, you'd be a very wealthy person today. And it's the same deal with the Bitcoin. It all has to do with the utility it provides. So um, we, the Bitcoin to recap, has a steady supply, which is algorithmically constrained. No one entity can manipulate that. And you'd have to get every person who holds Bitcoins, the entire network, to agree, which won't happen. Uh, the, because it's fixed, the currency is intrinsically deflationary. Because there is a natural demand due to anonymity and low transaction fees, the price will increase. And we don't have economic theory to talk about at what rate this is going to decrease and what long-term effects this is going to have. Okay, so let's talk about money exchanges now. So in general, money exchanges are called forex exchanges. Kind of a simple term. If you're curious about it, I would recommend you go to this link right here. Forex is a good way to make money if you're willing to invest a couple of years of your life and a couple of thousands of dollars in painful, terrible mistakes. But Investopedia has a wonderful series of tutorials on how foreign exchange works. And the further your understanding of money and currencies, I'd highly recommend taking these tutorials and perhaps even buying a book on Forex to get a better sense of how currency is traded. Because the Bitcoin, just like dollars to euro or dollars to pounds, is in itself a foreign exchange. Interestingly enough, the currency exchange markets are the largest markets in the world. If you think oil is big, oil is a small market compared to the money markets. Forex exchanges are pretty amazing and uh, remarkable structure. Um, they're usually, whenever you're dealing with a market as intricate, complex, and large as the foreign exchange market, uh, you're going to attract some incredibly sophisticated investors, people who spend their entire lives to, to figure out how to do something 0.05% better than the competition. And to give you a notion of how valuable these people can be, I've included a job link. So this is a job for an algorithmic trading forex company. It's in uh, Paris, Geneva, and London. So. There's probably a couple of jobs available. And the starting rate is a quarter million, uh, 200,000 pounds to a half million pounds. And 
some cases the salary is even larger and this is just one job these are called quantitative analysts and their job is basically to construct financial products uh, not only for foreign exchange markets but for basically any market commodities equities long-term security ex fixed income securities excuse me uh, and this should give you a sense, though, of the amount of money that is being handled here and the utility for figuring out how to manage risk while trading these kinds of money. So money exchanges are a big deal. What's really also unique about money exchanges is that unlike stocks and bonds, where the United States historically has not really taken a strong interest in other than just regulation, they don't take an ownership position like the United States does and say, we're going to purchase this many shares in Microsoft up until recently with um, the auto bailout and uh, the bank bailout, amongst other things. Generally speaking, nation states do not participate in equity or bond markets outside of what they must do to stabilize and keep their currency running. Money exchanges, on the other hand, sovereign nations tend to deal with them. They tend to not only regulate them, but have a vested interest in using money exchanges to affect whatever outcome they desire. For example, the Chinese government uses exchanges to ensure that the value of the yuan is low, the renminbi is low, so that they can go ahead and continue having very high exports to keep their economy going. So uh, this, is, this, as you can imagine, adds a considerable amount of complication to the analysis and management of portfolios within money exchanges, forex exchanges, because you have not only regular everyday people, but you also have governments playing around and toying with things. Now, in terms of Bitcoin exchanges, right now the market is only four years old. And as with any new market, you expect uh, a small group of people to control most of the exchange. And it's only reached about a billion dollars in capitalization. And the largest exchange is Mt. Gox. We're going to have an entire lecture on Bitcoin speculation, where I'll show you in more detail uh, Mt. Gox and talk about the Bitcoin price and how people make money through speculation. But for the purposes of this lecture, just be aware this is one of the websites that you would go to to go ahead and speculate in the Bitcoin industry, i.e. exchange your money, whether it be euros, yen, U.S. dollars, into the Bitcoin. If you so chose to transfer your money into Bitcoins, the current market price is $92 for a Bitcoin. When I first started buying Bitcoins, they were 10 cents. So these markets are pretty amazing. This went as high as $266 not too long ago. In fact, you can see the price spike up here. It's pretty, pretty volatile. <laughs> so that's why we're going to have a whole lecture on it. Um, Mt. Gox is responsible for a large chunk of all of the Bitcoin transactions as of now. That said, venture capital has begun investing millions, literally millions of dollars in developing not only new exchanges, but also financial products to better serve the needs of Bitcoin speculators and Bitcoin merchants. I will discuss this in more detail in my, um, in my speculation lecture, but for the time being, just be aware that uh, there is a lot of interest in basically building uh, products that will reduce the volatility of the Bitcoin price in relation to currencies like the US dollar to make it more attractive as not only an investment opportunity, but also as a unit of commerce, a unit of exchange. Currently, the US dollar is t closely tied to the Bitcoin. It's the closest tied currency. Um, I've included a slide here. It gives you an idea of the exchange volume. So Mt. Gox, as I said, is handling most of the trade volume, about 60%. And then you see 7% for BTCE, Mt. Gox Europe has got 6%, BTC2, 24 euro is 5%. Um, what's interesting is Mt. Gox used to have almost 90% of the trade volume, and it's decreased to 60%, which is a good thing. It means that we're starting to see a little bit more variety and diversification in the uh, Bitcoin exchange market. You can see that the euro and the US dollar are the two primary currencies that we've been seeing exchange with the Bitcoin in. But the US dollar used to be much, much higher, over 90%. So over time, we're starting to see more diversification in the currencies being exchanged for the US dollar, which is a very promising thing because if this trend continues uh, and more nations participate with the Bitcoin, it would be very easy for almost no transaction fee whatsoever to take your money, US dollars, and convert them into euros, or your money, US dollars, and convert them into, for example, the British pound. 
why this is important is remember a few slides ago when I mentioned that when you purchase your Xbox, a very complex series of regulations and money exchanges and other things have to happen. If we get uh, a sufficient volume of Bitcoins being exchanged to other currencies, you could completely avoid that entire elegant, magical, super complex network of stuff and pay almost no exchange fee, which by itself adds a tremendous utility to the Bitcoin makes the Bitcoin a very, 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 very valuable service because it literally costs hundreds of billions of dollars per year worldwide to maintain these kinds of exchanges. And uh, if this can be done in a decentralized peer-to-peer -peer fashion, it would, uh, the Bitcoin would be worth at least the minimum of that utility, meaning over $1,000 per coin. Okay, relationship to other currencies. Certain monies are going to always be tied together. The price of the Chinese currency, the yuan, the renminbi, is closely tied to the U.S. dollar. And this is because China sells lots of stuff to the United States. And they need to make sure that when we keep buying their goods with U.S. dollars, they keep printing money so their goods are cheap in comparison with our money, so that the commerce stays the same. Their factories can be running. This is why we call them a currency manipulator. It has impact on us, amongst other entities. So it's important if you're an economist, if you're a trader, to understand which currencies are very closely tied together. The US dollar and the Iranian money is not very closely tied together. US dollar and the money of North Korea are not very closely tied together because we have very strained political relationships with these governments and we don't trade with them. So whether the dollar goes up or down, it may have an indirect impact on the value of the Iranian currency or the value of the North Korean currency. It's going to have significantly less than, let's say, the value of the Chinese currency or the European Union's currency, the euro. Geography also has an incredibly important uh, effect on the price of money. There's a relationship between the Canadian dollar and the U.S. dollar because of the amount of trade, and also the peso in Mexico and the U.S. dollar because of the amount of trade between our countries. It, that would not be apparent if Mexico, for example, was in the place of Argentina. Argentina's money has less of a connection to the U.S. dollar than the peso does because of geography. And these relationships are studied by economists and by traders alike. And as I mentioned, there's a strong connection between the U.S. dollar and the euro. It is, um, it, if you're good at this and you really like this, I highly encourage you um, to pursue a career as a professional trader or at very least as a uh, economist. There's a lot of jobs in this field. They're very interesting jobs. You get to travel a lot and you make a lot of money. But if you're a trader, you're usually seeking to exploit patterns and trends for financial gain. Whereas if you're an economist, generally speaking, you're usually seeking to discover how economies tend to become interconnected due to trade and then predict future growth or contraction. You also may be able to say, hey, we're too closely connected to this particular nation's economy. That may be in our nation's best interest to perhaps divest our closeness, to build some structures to say, hey, we're insulated in the event that this country fails. Um, the banking crisis was so devastating back in 2008 when it collapsed our economy and when it hurt our economy, it cascaded and rippled because of our interconnectedness to other economies and collapsed Iceland, for example, and has led to many problems in Europe that have resulted in uh, problems in the, what are called the pigs, Portugal, um, Italy, um, Greece, and Spain. Sometimes we substitute Italy for uh, Ireland. But um, the relationship with other currencies is very closely studied. The relationship between the Bitcoin and other currencies is also closely studied. And what we see is the U.S. dollar tends to be the most prevalent, has the strongest connection, I should say, to the Bitcoin. 75% of the Bitcoin exchange volume comes from the U.S. dollar. Historically, by looking at the statistics, we've seen that um, the U.S. dollar, when it weakens, it, that tends to strengthen the Bitcoin. However, most of the people who are currently invested in the Bitcoin are um, not institutional, sophisticated investors. So uh, dollar weakening is not terribly reflected. It's not terribly well reflected in the price of the Bitcoin. Over time, as more institutional investors involve themselves with the Bitcoin, this uh, 
dollar weakening trend will become much more amplified, similar to gold. The most interesting pattern uh, seen is that if a central bank or a government takes actions deemed to be harmful to the holders of a currency, the Bitcoin tends to rise significantly. The most prevalent event was the Cyprus issue. And to refresh your memory, this is a case where Cyprus decided that they were going to start taking money from people's bank accounts, and the people in the nation were incredibly upset about that. So the Bitcoin people decided, hey, let's go ahead and move our money from this national currency and convert it into the Bitcoin because there is absolutely no way they can freeze my account. There is no way they can do anything with this. Uh, they can't stop me from doing it. Once it's in there, I, it's my money, it's permanent, stable. And this, this actually caused a bubble. It re resulted in the Bitcoin going up from about $20 to over $266 at its peak. So the Bitcoin benefits tremendously when governments do things like seize assets, propose wealth taxes, central banks start massive inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the Bitcoin also seems to be, interestingly enough, an economic combination of a gold-backed currency with the ability to arbitrarily divide and suffers no political pressure whatsoever to behave in a certain fashion. So I mentioned with the dollar and many other currencies, a central bank is usually tasked with the mandate of keeping interest rates somewhat reasonable for the health of the economy and also employment rates high. We don't like having 12% unemployment or 10% unemployment. So they say reduce employment, unemployment to 4%, and they do this by currency manipulation. The Bitcoin is not tied to the welfare of a nation, and therefore it was never designed to be manipulated by other nation states. But this is problematic from an economic viewpoint because all the models we've built over the last 100 years to understand how currencies work and do things interestingly, uh, do interesting things, uh, have are not built in a way to to reflect this this behavior. So as of 2013, we really don't have good models. We we really don't. And it's going to take a few years. It's going to take a lot of experimenting and experience, and bubbles and and uh, busts to, to get to the point where we actually can model the Bitcoin in a reasonable way that people can understand. Finally, here's a metric I've invented called oligarchiness. In fact, um, we in the Bitcoin community have had to invent a couple of metrics to kind of describe our currency because of its um, unique nature. So oligarchalness comes from oligarchy. Oligarchy is ruled by the few. So in ancient times and even today, more often than not, governments tend to be influenced or directly controlled by a small group of very powerful people or entities. Currencies are no different. So a high oligarchalness currency is one that a small group of individuals, groups, or people have the ability to control that currency through supply, control that currency through some form of manipulation. For example, China prints more money to keep their money cheap. They do this for trade. And therefore, a small group of people in China, the people who control the government, have the ability to either make the money more valuable or less valuable without any of the Chinese people's input or will. Low oligarchical money is money that's typically backed by a commodity. It's typically divorced from a central bank. And there have been many throughout history where it's really difficult for a large group excuse me, for a small group of people to have a long-standing permanent influence over the currency. They may be able to temporarily manipulate the price, but this manipulation is not long-term. Um, low oligarchical currencies are not very common. They used to be much more common, especially when we talked about gold-backed currencies or silver-backed currencies, but over time they've been nearly ubiquitously replaced with um, fiat currencies that are subject to manipulation. And this is mostly because of the Bretton Woods Agreement, amongst other things that happened at the turn of the, um, at the mid part of the 20th century, uh, and because we decided that we were going to globalize and having commodity-backed currencies made globalization very difficult. What's interesting about the Bitcoin is that it's actually right now a high, highly oligarchicalist currency. It has a small group of people namely the people who are in charge of developing the Bitcoin open source software 
the Bitcoin mining pool operators, and the leadership of Mt. Gox, the largest exchange, who have a tremendous influence over the price and the legitimacy of the currency. In fact, if all of these entities got together and decided to collude, they could destroy the Bitcoin if they so chose. They, they could just shut it all down, and there's nothing anybody could do about it. Uh, if there was enough devoted fans of the Bitcoin, they would be able to go ahead and uh, restart it and repair it, but it would take years to fix the damage that these people could do. But there's good news. Over time, this influence has considerably decayed. When this first started, they controlled 100% of the market. They could do whatever they wanted. They could determine the algorithms, change the algorithms. But since they've said everything, and because the Bitcoin has become a global phenomena, they have lost a massive amount of control. Mt. Gox is now handling 60% of the trade. Within the next five years, probably 30 to 40%. The mining pool operators have become more spread out and uh, more diverse. And they're from different countries and they don't talk to each other, so it's much more difficult for them to collude. And we'll discuss mining pools in lecture four. Um, and also the open source organization controlling the Bitcoin software has done it in such a way that the entire Bitcoin community would have to accept changes to the Bitcoin client. And outside of changes for security, reliability, improving the performance of the initial goals of the Bitcoin, uh, it's very difficult for them. For example, let's say they decide to make 80 million coins, the upper limit on the Bitcoin generation, to do that. It's nearly impossible. Some things cannot be changed as a result of decisions they made. So the oligarchalness of the Bitcoin is decreasing over time considerably. As more entities enter the Bitcoin ecosystem, the level will get to the point where it's almost immune to control or manipulation by any one entity. In fact, uh, there's many people in the community, including myself, believe that if the Bitcoin survives for another four years with its current growth curve, it's probably going to be worth over $10 billion, and I'll discuss this more in the um, speculation lecture, because right now the entire Bitcoin market capitalization is about a billion, so we think there's going to be another order of magnitude growth in the value of the Bitcoin. But more importantly, nation states will not be able to control the Bitcoin. Right now, if the United States so desired for an investment of a couple hundred million dollars, they probably could destroy the Bitcoin or significantly hurt the Bitcoin. Within another four years, because of the distributed nature and future adoption, even the United States government, with all of its money, power, and control, would not be able to significantly influence the Bitcoin without a mammoth investment, one that I don't think we would have the political will to do. There's this issue of 51%. I will discuss this in the mining lecture. Don't worry about it. As another interesting footnote, those who have the greatest influence over the Bitcoin currently have a financial incentive for the Bitcoin to both survive and appreciate in value. That's what we call engineering good incentives. Part of the brilliance of Satoshi Nakamoto when he wrote this, his paper describing the Bitcoin is he engineered a system where the early adopters who would have the greatest control over the system have the largest incentive to ensure that the system continues to grow and survive, not only to make sure that the currency becomes more distributed and to, devise, to, and to devise, divest their accounts, but also to continue the initial design, because that's the only way the Bitcoin would increase in value. Uh, so the long of the short is that the Bitcoin will evolve if it survives into a currency like no other, a currency with almost no manipulation manipulatability possible, even by powerful nation states, which is, again, something that we're not used to uh, with our current economic models. Okay, so, so let's discuss some Bitcoin-specific metrics. The first metric is the mining pool hash rate and work distribution. So we're going to discuss this in great detail in the mining lecture, but for the time being, let me just tell you that new Bitcoins enter the economy uh, at a rate of about 25 coins every 10 minutes. And the algorithms try as hard as they can to ensure that this is the case. It's um, very complex how this is done. As a Bitcoin user, you never need to understand that. But it's important to know that these hash rates and work distribution are the mechanism upon which new money enters the system and enters the system to new, usually new people. Um, or it enters the system in a way that it will be distributed to people very quickly, which is important for how new money enters the system. Regulation. Okay. There's a organization called FinCEN. 
the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. And on March 18th, they said, let's look at the Bitcoin. And they wrote a memo. This is their memo. It's included in the links. Long and short is, they said, the Bitcoin is A-OK. -okay. You're allowed to speculate. You are, when you deal with the Bitcoin, basically dealing with the Bitcoin the exact same way as if you're dealing with the Euro or with the Pound. So... There you have it. It's legitimate now. And I've included a bunch of articles and links about this. Um, Bitcoin Magazine had a whole article about it. I'd encourage you to email them if you want a deeper understanding of this decision. You can also discuss this with uh, FinCEN if you so desire. I'm sure they'll be happy to address Bitcoin-related questions. All right. As I promised, we're going to discuss the Bitcoin Days Destroyed metric. Okay, so... If you're pretty clever, you probably noticed that I transferred Bitcoins between myself. And when I mentioned that we record every Bitcoin transaction, the transaction that you guys witnessed, people actually now know about. It's been recorded. It's permanently sealed in the Bitcoin blockchain. And if somebody cared to see, they would see a transaction between two Bitcoin wallets, one public key and the other public key. As these wallets are anonymous, no one in the world, except for you guys watching this class, know that that was a transaction between Charles Hoskinson and Charles Hoskinson. It could have been Charles Hoskinson to Shawin Tao. Doesn't matter, you see. Therefore, it's a really bad idea to measure the velocity of money, the movement of money in the economy, just based upon transactions alone because that tells you nothing. People could be moving huge amounts of money between their wallets uh, with no other parties involved, and it would be the same uh, idea as if you're just handing a $20 bill to yourself. You have a $20 bill in your right hand, and you hand it to your left hand, and then some economists will go by and say, oh, that's a transaction. So we, we obviously needed a new type of metric to go ahead and describe the movement of money with Bitcoins. And this is based on the idea of saying, it's called Bitcoin Days Destroyed, and this idea is just basically saying how long between when you've received the money and when you've spent the money. So let's, uh, I include an example. Let's say you received 10 Bitcoins five days ago, and then you bought a laptop for them today because that would be worth about $920 at market rates. So you can get yourself a pretty good laptop. Okay, so you bought a laptop, and to calculate the Bitcoin days destroyed, you'll just simply take the amount of Bitcoins you received and times them by the amount of time and days you've held them. So that's 50 Bitcoin days destroyed. And there's a large host of very rich and interesting and deep statistics about Bitcoin days destroyed on the website blockchain.info. Let's see here. And I've also included a link to uh, Bitcoin Stack Exchange, which uh, actually describes Bitcoin Days Destroyed in a little bit more detail. Uh, there's a whole cool thing here about why they're useful and why we care about them. All you really need to know is it's a measurement of the velocity of money. It's a measurement of how quickly money is moving through the economy, trying to compensate for the fact that transactions between one person to the same person are, happen to also be recorded. So there, this is our way of getting around that. The blockchain. Okay, so the blockchain is a... Is like a ledger. It's basically a history of every transaction that has ever occurred since the beginning of the Bitcoin, since 2009, when the Genesis block was created. So every block created is then inserted into the blockchain, and the, a block is a set of transactions that have occurred over the last 10 minutes or so. And to visualize this, I'll go ahead and show you on this website, blockchain.im. And uh, blockchain.info is currently upgrading their server tonight, uh, so I can't get you a live feed, but this is a, a feed from about seven hours ago. So this right here is the 231,887th block since the very first block of Bitcoins. Initially, when they were created, they were blocks of 50, now they're blocks of 25. We'll discuss this in much more detail in the mining lecture. What a block is basically comprises of is, for our purposes, is all the transactions that have happened over the last 10 minutes. So, unfortunately, because it's not a live feed, I can't say it's right now, but seven hours and 50, six hours and 58 minutes ago, there were 253 transactions. 
Uh, it's approximately 10 minutes, so sometimes less, sometimes more. Three minutes before that, another block was found. 551 transactions in that block. Seven hours and 15 minutes ago, 25 transactions, and so forth. And sometimes the uh, age gets a little wonky with their statistics. So this is not entirely right, but it gives you an approximate idea. But every transaction is verified and vetted, and the blockchain is the accounting ledger to verify these transactions. This is actually what prevents double spending. And again, we're going to go over this in much more detail in the mining lecture, and you'll have, develop a much more intuitive sense of what exactly a blockchain is, what exactly the blockchain is for the Bitcoin. Okay, so that is all I have for you. Thank you for listening. Uh, this is a hard lecture to get through. I'm very tired, and I uh, hope you had fun. Bye-bye.